as Melody alluded to, two years from now, we'll be in the thick of the celebrating, I hope, of the county's bicentennial. And so I had prepared uh, a series of talks about the townships, the history of the townships, to present beginning, I started them in 2019. This society has heard uh, Fall Creek, Adams, and Anderson Township. Tonight you will hear Union Township. My plan was, before COVID made his appearance, my plan was, was to get through all of these townships, as many places in the county as I could, and that has slowed down considerably, but I thank the Historical Society tonight for asking me to come and present the, uh, from the What's in the Name series, Union Township. That is Union Township, beautiful, interesting, and quite small. It's the smallest township in our county with 19 and one half square miles within its borders, which is indeed the smallest. But when it was first organized as the county's sixth township, on May 30th, 1830, it was much, much larger. As originally carved out from Anderson Township by order of the Board of County Commissioners, it encompassed 63 square miles. So 63 square miles down to 19 and a half. They did some cutting. Its northern part was eventually absorbed with the organization of Richland Township in 1834, Monroe in 1836, and Van Buren in 1837, creating its present size. The commissioners designate the name of Union without leaving any explanation for the choice. That was true in a lot of our township creations. Um, some, some the, the naming is obvious, uh, others not so obvious. Union was one that uh, they didn't leave us a very good explanation for. Over time, some believed it was given that name on account of its being located opposite the point where the counties of Henry, Delaware, and Madison form a union. And through a Google Earth shot, you see that here. Madison, Delaware, and Henry counties all come together at that point where you see the arrows. When you get down on the ground, this is what it looks like. I'm in Madison County, to my left across the road is Delaware County, to my right across the road is Henry County. And that was one of the popular ideas behind the Union. Uh, the name Union was this, this here. But the more, like, more widely accepted reason is that the name was selected in recognition of the Federal Union of States. You see, that explanation is more reasonable owing to the fact that by 1830, when the township was formed, the United States of America had successfully withstood two attempts by England with the Revolutionary War and then the War of 1812 to defeat it and was no longer threatened. In other words, the Union forged by two, town, two wars was now secure. That's the more popularly accepted reason for the name Union Township. Some of the early people that were, in, were, were so uh, instrumental in Union Township's early history we begin with a man by the name of William Diltz. Those, is his, those are his years of his life. He's believed to be the first settler in Union Township. Uh, he arrived from Montgomery County, Ohio in March of 1821 and settled on the east bank of Mill Creek in what is now Chesterfield. He remained at this site for about four years, but not having sufficient financial means to enter the land it was claimed from under him, by a man by the name of Joshua Baxter in 1824. And that's the property. You may recognize that if you travel through Chesterfield, but that's the property that William Diltz first settled on. Mr. Diltz then moved to Delaware County, where he remained for four years. In 1829, he came back and entered 160 acres of land in the same section he previously occupied, only this time it was on the south side of the road that is now State Road 32. He erected a double pen log house in which he established the first hotel in the township. A double pen log house is basically two living areas attached with a roof over the, or with a roof over the covering between the area open between the two. In about 1833, he built a large brick house, which was the first in our township. This map shows you where Diltz first settled and where he finally settled here. So just east of the original location in Chesterfield. And I don't know how many of you remember that 
picture I do because look at his roof. In the shingles is the date 1833, indicating the year the house was built. Subsequent to that, the uh, has been reshingled and repainted. I've been in the house. It's fascinating inside. Um, Janine and I had an opportunity to go over. We were invited by the owner uh, and present uh, occupant of the house uh, several years ago, and we toured uh, upstairs, downstairs, all around. It was an interesting place. Uh, you had to duck your head in a few places. Frederick Bronenberg Sr. is the next name that I'd like to examine with you that came to Union Township. There are his years. It was at the site of the William Dilt's first log cabin that Frederick Bronenberg Sr. stopped with his family in June of 1821. There are conflictions on that date. I've heard as early as, or read as early as 1819, uh, but I think the more popular timing is, is 1821. He was on his way to the prairie country in Illinois when one of his oxen gave out. The, where they were headed was uh, Sangamon County, which is where Lincoln ended up in Illinois. Uh, while seeking assistance from Mr. Diltz, Bronberg was told there was no roads to speak of farther west, thus he decided to locate in the area. Once again, there, is, there are conflicting stories. This story about the uh, wagon breaking down and the uh, Mr. Diltz informing him that they couldn't go any further. Another story persists that a young child, a baby, an infant, was with them and the infant contracted something and died. So they buried the child. And Mrs. Bronenberg said to Mr. Bronenberg, I can't leave. He moved his family into an abandoned cabin that had been previously been occupied by an Indian trader named McChester. And boy, did I have to fight that one because they thought that's the origin of Chesterfield. No. In the spring of 1822, he built a cabin of his own north of White River. Remember that, north of White River. Nearby, he erected a sawmill. The sawmill was here. You see my arrow on White River. This is Emerald Glen. This is the Timberline Camping Ground. And that's the bridge, or that's the road and the bridge over White River back way into Chesterfield. So up on the river here was where his mill was located. And going to the ground and taking a shot across the way, somewhere in this area was, was Mr. Bronenberg's mill. Burrs for the grinding of both corn and wheat were added later, so it became, we went from a sawmill, and he added a grist mill. Timberline family ground, campground. If, you ever, if you've ever driven in there, you go by millstones, don't you? Well, I got curious, and I went to the office. And I said, where did those millstones come from? Well, the girl in there, she didn't know, but she says, let me call the owner. So she got on the phone. She called, he, she called the owner, and he said, I don't know, but he says, the people that we bought the campground from say that they found the millstones west of here along the river and drug them over here. I'll leave that to your conclusion, but... <laughs> That's pretty good evidence because there are quite a few of them around the area. And those things, I'm telling you, are heavy. The family eventually became large landholders in our county, particularly in Union Township. The Bronenberg family, I've, I've said this before, we had an exhibit here a number of years ago uh, up for the Bronenberg family. And uh, they came in by the bus loads. Uh, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. I bet you, I'm going to ask a show of hands. If you are related to a Bronenberg, raise your hand. Okay, there we go. There's always one. There's always one. This is a Bronenberg home. Carol Bronenberg was his name, and he is one of the children of Frederick and his wife. Uh, you may recognize this home. It's out on um, the road across from the Bronenberg Cemetery that comes out of Chesterfield. I've had a lot of fun with that house. Well, not a lot of fun, but I'm continually asked 
about underground railroad activity in Madison County. Get that all the time. And so I wrote an article about it, you know, was it last spring or whenever, trying to straighten that all out for everybody so they would understand where the Underground Railroad activity occurred and at what period of time it occurred in Madison County. And I still got people who want to place this house as an Underground Railroad, and they're sure of it. My grandfather told me that, they say. I know it, I know it to be a fact. Well, the, the problem with that is that that house was built in 1867 two years after the Civil War and slavery ended. So it's not likely that it was an underground railroad. Well, that is Carol Bonnenberg, one of the children of Frederick Bonnenberg Sr. And now the Bonnenberg family and their house, uh, this is Frederick Bonnenberg Jr., that his house is in Mounds Park, and you all know this, and boy, to the to the members of the Friends of the Mounds Park, you got to salute what they do. And there's, raise your hand if you're in that organization. There you go. You got to salute what they do, how, how well they take care of that place and uh, how, how well they interpret it and so forth. It's just, that's a first class operation. And to have a house that old look that good, I think is just wonderful. The Brandenburg Cemetery. A massive make peace. So we've done William Diltz, we've done Frederick Bronenberg Sr., and now we're doing a massive make peace. Those three names are, and then there's others, but those three names were so uh, uh, in, in, intertwined in Chesterfield history. And then you're going to hear another one towards the end of this story that um, our treasurer, our treasurer, is going to learn a piece of information from. Major influence in the development of Chesterfield was the arrival of Amasa Makepeace. Uh, he and his wife Betsy were married about 1800 in Norton, Massachusetts. The couple moved to Chesterfield, New Hampshire, where they remained until 1818 when they and their children moved west, eventually arriving here in the year 1823. And in a yard, there in Chesterfield is this uh, a stone, as you can see, Make Peace Farm, 1823. And I'll try to show you with my shot here where it is. My arrow is pointing to it right here. It's State Road 32, Make Peace Park. And uh, this was the original Make Peace Farm. And that stone is in the ground denoting that. In 1825, uh, he built the first grist mill on Mill Creek, affording the settlers in the east central part of the, of the county a place to take their grain to have it ground. Uh, before that, you had to go to Pendleton. That was the only place you could go, and that was generally from Union, from that part of the county was a three-day trip. A day there, a day to get there, a day there, and a day to get back. The day that you were there, you visited with your neighbors and you tipped the jug that was on the wall. That is an old picture of the original Make Peace Mill in Chesterfield. That's the hillside where it was located, Make Peace Park. West Union, Mill Creek, Chesterfield. Three names. The couple's son, Alan, is credited with laying out of the town in 1830. Known first as West Union, it was renamed Chesterfield in 1834. Because Allen was given the responsibility of laying out of the town, it seems natural that his influence caused the town to be named Chesterfield, naming it after his birthplace in New Hampshire in 1802. That's so common across the United States, so, so common. Uh, names are, as people moved west, they would rename a settlement or name a settlement after a place where they came and so you can see names as they just pass across America going uh, from east to west. Hard Scrabble is another one of those in Madison County that has that same history behind it. A pioneer custom practiced all across our nation as I just said. Here's an old map that I have. Uh, it's an 1838 uh, map and it shows you it is designated Chesterfield in 1838, 
In 1839, though, this map maker still called it West Union. When the Indianapolis and Bell Fountain Railroad was completed through Madison County in 1852, Chesterfield experienced several years of unusual business activity. Population increased so much, uh, to such an extent, that in the late summer of 1857, a petition was circulated and signed by a large majority of the citizens asking for incorporation as a town. In other words, they would form a town board and the, town, and the board would run the, the, the affairs of the town. Uh, an election was held on January 2nd, 1858, with 32 votes cast in favor and none against. On March 11th, 1858, the county commissioners ordered the incorporation. Mill Creek was the name given to the post office at Chesterfield. It opened on March the 15th, 1827, and continued to be known by that name until it was changed to Chesterfield, February 9th, 1848. Amasa and son George Makepeace were the only postmasters during its 21 years of operation. The name must have had some lasting recognition as it appears on an 1864 and an 1870 county map, and that is the uh, aforementioned Mill Creek as it passes beneath State Road 32. And here you see on this map, dated 1839, the reference to Mill Creek. These are post office names. This is a post office map showing you the names of post offices in that year, Mill Creek being here in Madison County. And then you see it again here in an 1864 map where it just carried over. Um, map maker didn't know that uh, time had run out. And you see it again here. Historic Chesterfield, and boy is it historic. Mm -hmm. That's a uh, plat map of Chesterfield dated 1901. And I've got it laid out kind of how the next photograph is, was depicted. Here you see the uh, railroad coming across to the south. This would be what we know as State Road 32, White River, and you can see basically the same thing, the uh, State Road 32, White River, it's laid out just exactly the same thing. But look, I'll back it up. Look how it has grown. Look how it has grown. In 1827, Amasa Makepeace Sr. built in Chesterfield, Union Township, the first house in all of Madison County. This was not a one-story rough-hewn log cabin with a dirt floor as most early settlers were living in. This home was an impressive two-story structure framed and finished with uh, planned or planed lumber and insulated with plaster instead of mud chink instead of mud chinking and daubing. And the source of that comment is Melody's website, the pioneer cemeteries of their stories in Madison County, Indiana. And this is the house. And we showed you that earlier. That was on the Make Peace property. If you ever drive by that, check out the chimney. If that doesn't tell you something of its age, nothing will. Several years ago, I, was, I did a radio show, a uh, weekly radio show with Doug Zook. And uh, one of the ladies came in, was a guest of his, and she lived in that house. And so in between segments on, on the radio, we talked about that house. And she was telling me that her husband had gone down below and was digging it out, trying to make a basement underneath it, and ran into all kinds of artifacts. All kinds of artifacts and construction uh, things that she used to describe the construction house. She said, there's no question that is an old, old house. Two brothers, Alan Makepeace and George Makepeace. Alan built this house in Chesterfield in 1850. And his brother George built this house. Oh, that's, I'm sorry, this is the back of Alan's house. And his brother George built this house, same year, 1850. Two brothers built two houses, same year, across the street from one another. I've been in this one on the first floor. Um, some of you may know this was an apothecary. 
and it was built up so that deliveries could be made in wagons or pickups. And you can see that the that that's a big first step if you wanted to step that, but it was built up for wagons to pull up and pick up or drop off medicines in the apothecary. That's it from the back. And there I stepped out in the street carefully to get a shot of both of them. Make Peace Park, all part of Chesterfield's rich history, as is Camp Chesterfield. Camp Chesterfield, as some of you may know, is a spiritualist camp, first started in the 1890s. And uh, I have a picture here of the uh, homes on the uh, property. If you've never been in there, that's really an interesting place to just walk and, and just sit down and observe. Um, the day I was there, I asked permission to go in, and um, I was heavily questioned as to what my motives were and uh, what I was going to do with the pictures if I was going to make a profit off of the pictures. And no, not that. And then I was requested not to photograph anybody, that the residents do not want to be photographed. Well, I walked out of the office and had this big Nikon camera hanging on, on the front of me, and there was people all over the place, and you thought Frankenstein had come onto the property because they just <laughs> scattered, uh, did not want to be photographed, so I was very respectful of that. And Sly Fork. In my map of Union Township, my arrow points to Sly Fork. Here's Chesterfield. Sly Fork was down here near the old Pennsylvania Railroad, or Panhandle. Some of you may remember it by that name. Uh, it was a stop on the old Panhandle Railroad, almost uh, three miles directly south of Chesterfield, about midway uh, between Anderson and Middletown. Uh, when the railroad was completed in the mid-1850s, Sly Fork was established to serve the town of Chesterfield, which by that time was a going concern. There was a platform beside the tracks, but as far as is known, there was never a station or a spur track there. Uh, the warehouse was maintained at the site by a man by the name of James Ross, and uh, the building burned in 1871. Freight bound for Chesterfield was unloaded from the Panhandle cars uh, on the Sly Fork platform and hauled the rest of the way to its destination by ox cart. So if you had something in Chesterfield that you wanted to ship on the Panhandle, that's how you got it back and forth was an ox cart. There was a general store in the settlement operated by Benegal and Tucker, uh, that uh, later by Burr and Wendell. It was during that latter occupancy that it burned. Uh, there was a post office uh, there uh, named Branson's that operated from January 20th, 1862 until it closed May 31. 1866. By 1874, there was nothing to indicate it. there was a town there except a few empty houses. So it's one of those communities that just dried up and went away. A short distance northeast of Sly Fork and Mill Creek take their rise. The former flows south to Fall Creek and the latter north to White River near Chesterfield. One of those odd things. We got a couple places like that in Madison County. You see Mill Creek here takes its rise right where that arrow is and flows into Chesterfield on its way to White River. Sly Fork takes its rise here and flows south, eventually making its way to Fall Creek. There is a divide there. We have that same situation just north of Summitville. You can stand in, in, the, in the rise in Summitville and look at this water going to the Wabash, and you look at this water, and it's going to the White River. Sly Fork here, you can see, uh, back it up here, you can see the old red bed, or road bed of the uh, Panhandle Railroad that came through there, and Sly Fork was right there on it, a little bit closer in. And you see a reference to it here on this map. Bubbling Springs is just on the uh, county line between Madison County and Delaware County, uh, east of uh, Chesterfield. It was a name given to an area on the east side of County Road 500 East and the north side of State Road 
32 intersection. At one time, it was an inner urban stop and a gas station. Uh, an artesian well was located there, providing the name. And here you see a Google Earth shot of the bubbling springs. This is State Road 32 as it's coming in from Delaware County. I-69, here's the is Chesterfield. And Bubbling Springs was this first intersection right here. And then I'm going to show you a pond here. My arrow points to that. And here it comes. The reason why the uh, Bubbling Springs was so popular is because the, the water table there was so high that it's very near the surface of the ground. And so people who wanted to put in farm ponds was no hardly any effort to it at all. You just break the ground, go down a few feet, and you've got water. And here you see an inner urban car pulling into Bubbling Springs, State Road 32. Buckstown. My arrow points to it here on the White River. Here's Chesterfield. So as you come out the road past Mr. Williams, yes. Mr. Williams' house, you're coming up on Buckstown. The distinction of being the oldest named place in Union Township goes to the Delaware Indian Village located on a bluff overlooking White River about one mile northwest of Chesterfield. Established around 1815, it was called Kibuckstown or simply Buckstown by the early settlers after the village chief, Captain Kilbuck, also known by his Christian name, Charles Henry Kilbuck. Buckstown was on this bluff, which was typical of the placement of Indian villages. They always wanted to be high enough that they could see an approaching enemy. That was important to them. And as if you go over there, well, I'll show you here right now. It's on this bluff above White River. And that's Buckstown. Log cabin, canals, and one-room schoolhouses. Inside this barn, the owners called me one day and wanted me to come out and see this because they have a dilemma. The dilemma is that the barn is about to fall down. And the only thing that's holding the barn up is a log cabin that's inside the barn. The barn was built to protect the log cabin and then used for other things. But its primary reason was to protect the log cabin. The dilemma that they have is the barn is on a tilt. You can't see it here. It's tilting towards us. And they really don't know what to do with it. They allowed my wife and I inside with the promise that we would not reveal its location. Inside is a log cabin. It's hard to get a good photograph of it because you're right on top of it. I did go inside of it here. It has a first floor and then it has a, I'm going to, I'm going to call it a second floor. It wouldn't be a second floor in the traditional sense, but it's high enough to be a second floor. But the thing that is so unusual about it is that all of the joists and rafters inside are all tree limbs with the bark still on them. And what I'm told by experts in that field here in Madison County in Indiana, that if you have a, a a structure such as this with the bark still on it, on the log, that stopped after 1838 in Indiana. So that means that this was built sometime before 1838. I'll tell you this, it's north of White River. Do you remember when I asked you to remember Frederick Bronenberg's description of the log house that he built north of White River? Think about it. Think about it. Interesting place. Yes. Do they have plans for that? 
<laughs> right now the plan is trying to figure out how to keep the barn from collapsing because that's their their primary concern um, I gave them a couple of suggestions of, of uh, places to call that might uh, um, might be of assistance. Uh, one was Connor Prairie, the other was Indiana Landmarks. I suggested both places to them that uh, there might be help available there. Uh, I was by there a few weeks ago and, and I haven't, there's, can't see that they've done anything other than could be inside, they've shorted up and supported it. But that's their primary concern is that's gonna come down and when it does, down will come the log cabin. And that's a real that's a real gem in our county. That it's, it's before 1838. Could it have a connection to Frederick Bronnenberg? I don't know, but I'm planting a seed. Several years ago, I was doing an um, article and research on the hydraulic canal, which incidentally, I have up here some flyers. On the 28th day of August, next, the Indiana the Canal Society of Indiana is going to hold a symposium at the Anderson Public Library. And I will be speaking in the morning and the afternoon, and um, a good friend of mine by the name of Andy Olson, who has spoken here before, he will be speaking just after lunch. Uh, and this is all about the canals in Indiana and I'm going to talk about the canals here in Madison County. And so it's open to the public, and a special invitation has been issued to the Historical Society. Uh, I'll put these, uh, I'll put these, Barry, if you'd put those in that chair right beside you. Please take one if you're interested. Um, thank you, Barry. Please take one if you're interested. Uh, I think it will be a fun day. Back to the story. I'm doing some research on the hydraulic canal, and a good friend of mine has a piece of the hydraulic canal in excellent condition on his property. So he invited me to come out and see it. So I did. And we're walking along the hydraulic canal, and he keeps talking about this canal over here. Well, the first time he said that, I ignored it. But then he said it again. He says, the canal over here. And I stopped him, and I said, what canal are you talking about? And he says, there's a canal over here. Well, I knew the hydraulic canal was there. There was not a lateral to the hydraulic canal, so I'm, I'm confused. I said, when we get done here, let's, you show it to me. Okay, so we got done with our visit to the hydraulic canal. Then we went tramping across the uh, brush, um, scattering all kinds of animals, and I stepped out into this. I stepped out into this and my jaw dropped. I instantly recognized what that is. When the Central Canal, 30 years earlier, was being built in Madison County, there was a thought of connecting Anderson Town to Muncie Town via a canal. And then that canal would meet up with the Whitewater Canal that came up from Brookville through Hagerstown to Muncie would hook into the feeder branch that would bring it over to Anderson to tie into the Central Canal which came from the Wabash River. I know I've just confused you, so come to the symposium and I'll straighten all that out for you. I did that on purpose. Um, went, but the, that, that canal went bust for a lot of reasons, financial basically was the main thing. And so the builders of the canal, the Central Canal, the first one, turned in a report to the state legislature about their activities, where they built canals here in Madison County. And I've got that report. And I can take you here in Madison County today and show you what's left of what was built. Nowhere in that report did they talk about building the, fe the feeder branch that will connect Muncie to Anderson. That's it. That's how all, that's all they got done. That's about uh, 100 yards, football field length, roughly speaking. That's all they got done. But it's no question that is the prism, the footprint, whatever you want to call it, of a canal. And it's right beside the White River. 
what has happened over the years in this flat land is White River has flooded, silted that in because this canal now is only about two feet deep, but originally it was six feet deep. But the silt over the years has filled that in. But that is the feeder branch because it's parallel to the hydraulic canal, which is way up on a bluff, had nothing to do with the operation of the hydraulic canal. And now I'm getting into my talk in August, and I'm going to stop there. Uh, again, the property owner has sworn me to secrecy, although he's, he's relenting a little bit, and he says if people want to know where it is, they can come, they, you can tell them. So if you want to know afterwards, I'll tell you where it is. This is an interesting story. This is the reservoir for the hydraulic canal. When the hydraulic canal was built in eight, late 1860s, early 1870s, it paralleled the White River. It started north of Daleville, and it dropped to Anderson, a, about a 44-foot drop, as I've often said many times. People in Daleville still look down on Anderson. <laughs> But they needed, because they used the, the White River as its source of water, they needed a backup in case of low water. And so they built this reservoir. You know where that is? I showed you Bubbling Springs and the big pond. It's right next to it. It's right next to it. A dear friend of mine and Gerald Jones who's no longer with us, but was an active member in this society, an active member in our Civil War Roundtable, a man by the name of Curtis McGuire. Curtis told me that his grandfather worked for the Hydraulic Canal Company and helped build that. Helped build that. Well, I've had my eye on that property for a number of years. This is dated March of 2009. One day I was having a program here for another reason, another group of people, and a lady got up after the program was over and she says, I have to give you some bad news. And I said, what? And she says, my sister owns the property where the reservoir is. She drained it. She... Uh, she had a, a machine come in and make a cut in the bank of the reservoir and let all the water drain down into White River. And I said, holy mackerel, that's a piece of our history. And she says, I know it, and I'm going to go tell her about it. <laughs> I saw her a couple months later, and she says, my sister said she'll get it repaired. Wonderful. That's July of 2016. We're now at July 2021, five years later, and it still looks like that. If you go to Bubbling Springs and you take the county road 500 east down and cross the river, just as you cross the river, immediately when you cross the river to your left or west is this, and then just a few feet beyond this, like... Here's the reservoir, here's the river, here's the reservoir, here's that big pond that I showed you earlier. In Union Township, there are a few old schoolhouses. This is the district school number one, also known as the Cup and Saucer School. You have to go around behind the building to see the lighter colored brick mixed in with the red brick form a <laughs> very crude cup and saucer, but that's where the name comes from. <laughs> Valley Grove, Union Township. That's the original Valley Grove School. In 1932, in 1932, the Madison County Historical Society purchased a 100-year-old 15 by 20 foot Daniel Nolan log cabin located two miles south of Chesterfield from Daniel's son Andrew for twenty dollars now Andrew his son lived in California had no interest in his dad's cabin the historical society was interested in it because in 1932 
the park had only been formed, uh, Mounds Park had only been formed two years. And the Historical Society was really interested in turning the new Mound State Park into a pioneer settlement. The state thought that was a bad idea. Pioneer settlements, they'll never fly. <laughs> Connor Prairie? <laughs> anyway, anyway. So his son said, I'll sell it to the Historical Society for $20. Well, Gerald Jones, in our treasury, as you all know, the Historical Society has never been flush with money. Never been flush with money. And in 1932, Depression, our treasury in 1932, to buy that, to pay $20, all we had in our treasury was $11.40. And so, a man by the name of Arthur Brady who was with the Union Traction Company, donated the $20, a member here, donated the $20, and we bought the cabin. The Mound State Park Superintendent, E.P. Lacey, had it dismantled, logs were numbered, and reconstructed, and I found this in the August 20th, 1932 issue of the Anderson Daily Bulletin. Couple pictures of it. If you wanna know where that was, if you know, uh, you remember the horse barns? And then later the swimming pool, that area right out front, that's where Daniel Nolan's log cabin was located. And I got even a better picture. It was a nice looking thing. Well, why isn't it there? Well, I had to do some searching there too through our records. And what I found was in the January 20th, 1974 Madison County Historical Society meeting minutes, the meeting, the society's meeting, just like what we had this evening, the board meeting over here, in the minutes of that board meeting was the following statement for January 2nd, 1974. The Nolan Log House has been destroyed because of termites. So it's gone. Union Township Pioneer Cemeteries I always like to end these township presentations with the Pioneer Cemeteries. Uh, the purpose of the Madison County Cemetery Commission is to restore and preserve the early cemeteries of Madison County. Uh, the following photographs and descriptions of the known Pioneer Cemeteries in Union Township are from the website Pioneer Cemeteries and Their Stories, Madison County, Indiana. The website was produced and written by Melody Hall for the Cemetery Commission of which she is a member uh, and it's with grateful appreciation that I acknowledge her efforts in providing the information that follows. If you've not accessed that website, boy, that's entertaining. That, that's something you want to do, just sit down and read. She, she's, she's done a wonderful job with that. Uh, these again are the Pioneer Cemeteries, and I think the Cemetery Commission kind of says if it's dated, if there's a known death in there by 1850, it's... Yeah. It's, it's, it's a Indiana pioneer. Law, but Indiana, okay. 1850 or earlier. That's the Brandenburg Cemetery. There's where it's located. Its oldest known date of death in there is September the 19th, 1836. The Clem Benzenbauer Cemetery. You see its location. Oldest known date of death is May 1851, although I'm sure there's earlier barrels in there. We just don't know the, we don't know the date for sure. Unmarked. Unmarked. The County Infirmary, the Potter's Field, Poor Farm Cemetery. That's on the property that now belongs to the Anderson Airport. There's its location next to Otterbein Cemetery. The oldest known date of death there is 1899. It's obviously not a pioneer cemetery, but it's old and it's got a history to it, and so I acknowledge it. The Keesling Ellison New Keesling Cummins Cemetery. There'll be a test on these names when we're done. <laughs> There's its location. Uh, oldest date there is April 27th, 1859. The Otterbein Make Peace United Brethren Cemetery. Its location. 
Oldest date there is April 30th, 1825. Destroyed cemeteries, the Hurley Cemetery. And with that, folks, we've come to the end. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope that, um, I hope I've done my job and enlightened you a little bit on the township history, Madison County. <laughs>